is Matthew Fox. For those of you who don't know, Matthew is an internationally acclaimed spiritual theologian. He's in, he is an Episcopal priest and an activist who was a member of the Dominican Order for 34 years. He holds a doctorate, summa cum laude, in the history of theology and spirituality from the Institut Catholique de Paris and has devoted 45 years to developing and teaching the tradition of creation spirituality, which is rooted in the ancient Judeo-Christian teaching, inclusive of today's science and world spiritual traditions, welcoming the arts and artists, wisdom-centered, prophetic, and committed to echo justice, social justice, and gender justice. Matt is currently a visiting scholar at the Academy uh, for the Love of Learning in Santa Fe, New Mexico. We don't have time to list all of Matt's prophetic work here and now, but I strongly encourage you to receive his daily meditations to learn more about what Matt has accomplished and how you can benefit from it. If you go to daily meditations with matthewfox.org, you can receive those. Matt will speak for one hour, then he'll spend 30 minutes responding to your questions. Then we'll break down into groups of three to talk about the answer to the question, what did you hear that moved your heart? What did you hear that moved your heart? Matt, take it away. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Tony. And thank you, everybody, for being here and for being part of this circle of Illumin. It's just an important work you're involved in. I, I really want to say I've been lo really looking forward to being with you. And um, because I really think this issue of men is absolutely one of the absolute foundational issues of our time. <clears throat> if men cannot become more authentically men, uh, I don't think our species is going to survive. And um, of course, the compliment is the same, that women too have to be acknowledged and um, find their own healthy masculine inside if our species is going to survive. So this to me is a literally a, an extinction or non-extinction issue dealing with men again. And I think the timing is amazing because one of the prophets of the men's movement in my lifetime was certainly Robert Bly, who left us this past week, and we should all be grateful to him. It was my privilege to know him as a friend. He came to my program at Mundelein College in Chicago before he got in the men's movement, and he was into mysticism and into, he would play uh, Kabir, who he was translating the Eastern mystic with a mandolin on his lap. And my musical buddy of mine who taught in the program said <laughs> it was off tune and he was off tune, but it really didn't matter because um, his masculine voice would, had memorized the poetry, would speak it. And then he was counterbalancing that with this more feminine energy of a mandolin uh, even if it was uh, off key. And um, so anyway, I, I, I want to give a shout out to Robert Bly and his wonderful book, um, was it Poems of the Universe, where he gathers songs, poems from around the world um, about cosmology. We'll be getting into that shortly. Father Sky, in other words. And uh, it's a wonderful and powerful book. It's one of the tragedies of modern consciousness that we have been cut off from Father Sky. I'll be getting into that shortly. But the question Master Dress is how do men transform? How do men change? How do men change? And it was by himself who said that men change only by ritual. Now, Robert was capable of exaggeration, but even if he's 50% right, uh, it's very important to realize that ritual is what changes men. More than arguments and academic papers and all that, because ritual is bodily. And men are very bodily. <laughs> we like sports. And, and, um, 
and we like to climb rocks and get lost and wrestle and all these crazy things. And uh, it's part of our reality. And, uh, you know, but it has to be put into a context that, that really acknowledges the depth of that. Uh, and of course, grieving is, is one a very important part of ritual. And um, in fact, he led and invited me to lead with him along with Michael Mead and, and Melodome Somi, a ritual for Vietnam vets. Um, there were 1,400 people came to this big hall on the water in San Francisco for this event. 1,400 people, mostly men, but women too, they're nurses from Vietnam. And it was very powerful. And a big part of it was where well, the four of us were on stage, if you will, and spoke, uh, and there's some poetry and all this, but, and we, he got the men aroused to get anger, to show their anger, get rid of their anger, because anger, of course, is a first level of grief. It was very powerful. And then we all paraded, 1,400 of us with a candle each, out to the water. And there was an altar where we put the candle on. And Melodomi Somme, an African ritual leader, um, had this chant from Africa that we chanted all the way out to the water. And as soon as we came to the altar, a deluge, the sky opened up. And it hadn't rained in California in like three months. There was an absolute drought. And just, and I'll never forget turning to Bob and his white hair, matted hair was dripping. He was dripping, his hair was dripping with water. And we both said at the same time, Father Sky is crying. That, that um, our prayer had brought, as indigenous people know a lot about this, had brought in the powers of nature to mirror what we were doing. So that's just one example of ritual. And um, I can talk a lot more about that and the rituals of grieving, which I've done a lot of over the years. And of course, rites of passage, as we all know, they've been so missing from most of our lives. I mean, I remember once I had a class of about 60 students and um, actually Melodome Somi came and told about, talked about ritual and his practice of ritual and how he missed it when he was a teenager and what he had to do to you know, undergo his rite of passage and all this. And um, when he finished, I asked the people there, how many of you went through confirmation? Every hand went up, but, or bar mitzvah. Every hand went up but one. I said, how many of you remember it as a transformative experience in your life? Every hand went down. Every hand went down. 100% of Christian men and women never had a rite of passage. We have it in our closet. It's called confirmation, but it doesn't do anything because it's all about words. So another path to transformation besides ritual is virtue. Virtue. Hildegard of Bingen is so strong about how virtue represents the holy masculine, the sacred masculine, in women as well as men. And um, I'll share with you some of her language because uh, she is now a doctor of the church, which means essentially what that means is shut up and listen. This person has something to teach you. And uh, here's some of her language. Um, she writes to her nuns, prepare yourself for spiritual warfare. She writes, a brave warrior overcomes evil with combative prowess. Um, to monks, she writes, prepare your hearts to do battle for him who has given you the example. You have raised yourself up from your sins, so the virtues will gloriously take on form in you. And uh, she says, it was only humans themselves who did not know their creator. Be a strong warrior, nobly clothed in the magnificent armor of a true Solomon. You must be manly in your power and strength and untiring in your battle against the flesh and all your sinful cravings against the enemy of your soul. The strength of God's justice is at work and shows itself as a warrior against injustice until injustice is conquered. Christ is a very strong warrior and a virile young man. Perform the works of justice and holiness. She talks about the power of virtue. Now, the word virtue, sometimes we understand as something individual and personal. It's, that's part of it. But when you look at it socially, it's about values. I think value is a better word, really. Virtue is living out your values. It's a habit 
of practicing your values. And I want to take you to nothing less esoteric than Webster's Dictionary, the old Webster's Dictionary. I look up the word virtue, and this is what it says. It comes from the word vir for man, of course. V-I-R is a Latin word for man. More at viral. It means viral. This is virility. This is virility. This is what Muhammad said, that the real um, uh, jihad is with yourself. It's not with others. And it's so easy to forget that. Soldiers are never taught. The difference between warrior and soldier. We'll get into that a, a little more as we move along. But again, I'm just looking at the Webster Dictionary. Virile, a particular moral excellence, manly strength or courage. And this is pure Hildegard from the 12th century. And of course, Thomas Aquinas, who came 45 years after her, he develops his entire ethics on virtue. And he gets that from Aristotle, a pagan scientist, but, um, but he's also mirroring what Hildegard came to and what Webster's Dictionary tells us. A beneficial quality of power of a thing, manly strength or courage, valor, valor, another beautiful word about authentic masculinity, valor, virility, and value, virtue. So that's how you transform. But of course, I was glad with Bill's explanation of your organization that your first task is your inner work, as he said. And that's right. That's the difference between a warrior and a soldier, that the warrior does inner work. The soldier is just told, given a gun and say, kill or be killed. But the warrior does the inner work. And there's a big difference. Years ago, one of my students who was uh, indigenous, he was from Canada, First Peoples of Canada, he told this story in class about how he was in the Vietnam War. And when he came back, his elders said to him, well, now you've been a soldier, we're going to make you a warrior. I said, how long was the training? Four years. Four years. I can't stress that enough, because lazy journalists in our culture just slap together the words warrior and, and soldier as if they're the same thing. They aren't. Hafiz, the wonderful 14th century Sufi mystic, gets it right too. He said, it is a naive person who thinks we're not engaged in a fierce battle. For I see and hear brave foot soldiers all around me going mad, falling on the ground in excruciating pain, but you, you could become a victorious horseman and carry your heart through this world like a life-giving sun, S-U-N. Carry your heart through this world like a life-giving sun. That's what a man does. But only if you and God become sweet lovers. So the warrior is the mystic. The lover, that's the word that Bill used in describing what your organization is about, coming to grips with your powers of love. And then you take that into the world as a warrior. <clears throat> now, when this Canadian indigenous fellow, I asked him further, I said, well, what was your training like? Well, he said, first they taught me, my, the elders taught me to play a flute, a wooden flute, and I mastered it. And they called the whole tribe together one night. It was like a recital, and I played the flute for the tribe. And I played wonderfully. And at the end of the night, every elder came up with a knife in his hand and took a chunk out of my flute. So at the end of the night, I had nothing left but what I had given to the community. And I said, that sounds like my Starcard, who says the soul grows by subtraction, not by addition. He said, what Indian said that? I said, a 14th century Dominican monk who got called a heretic in his lifetime. Uh, well, actually, right after he died. Uh, well, I, he said, I asked that because all the training was like that. They taught me something, 
and they took it away. They taught me something, took it away. So clearly there's a big lesson here about letting go, the via negativa. To be a man, we have to learn things and also learn to let go of things. And you let go in meditation, contemplation, that's one way of letting go, but we also let go in suffering. Suffering teaches us lessons we don't otherwise learn very readily. And of course, good ritual teaches you to let go as well. So um, with those two suggestions, ritual and virtue, I want to now turn to my, my exploration of archetypes to uh, continue this reflection with you on trans how men transform. Marion Woodman is a Jungian psychologist out of Toronto, now deceased, who did quite a lot of work actually with Robert Bly. They did kind of a tag match together of the last years of, of uh, her active life. And um, one of the points she makes is this. She says, an archetype is like this. Think of your favorite song or your favorite painting. And that, what that does to you when, when you're moved by it, looking at the painting or listening to the music, how it moves you. She says that is about a thousand um, watts that moves you. An archetype, be ready for this, get ready, is a hundred thousand volts <laughs> that moves you. That's what an archetype is. It's like sitting in an electric chair. <laughs> I just love that a thousand for your favorite piece versus a hundred thousand. Holy shit. No wonder they've hidden archetypes from us men for so long because they wanted us to uh, get in line and play the games uh, that uh, are going to carry on the matricide of, against Mother Earth among other things, the murder of Mother Earth that we're engaged in today. This is why what you're doing is so essential. So there's so much authoritarianism today. And it's not just in America, though we're, we're doing a pretty good job leading it. January 6th will, was an epiphany, literally, on the epiphany. Remember, January 6th is the feast day, when the great feast day is the last feast day of Christmas for Christians, and it is the epiphany. And um, the last of the 12 days of Christmas. And what happened on Epiphany? The invasion of the Capitol and the murder of six people subsequently. And of course, hundreds, literally hundreds of Capitol police tortured and abused and like victims of war anywhere, anywhere, anytime, of course, with a lot of mental distress because of it all. And then we have a whole group of political people uh, saying it was nothing. It was a picnic. It was just strolling through the capital. So anyway, that's authoritarianism. And fascism is always a idolatry of masculinity. Always. That's part of its definition. That's why it's always putting down women. Now, another event we're involved in this week is, of course, the abortion debate. Now, I can't believe how badly this whole thing has been uh, uh, framed. That, that Roe versus Wade doesn't tell anyone they have to get an abortion. No one. It's just saying that if there are abortions that are going to happen, let's make it safe. Because for decades it wasn't safe, and not only was the fetus killed, but the woman's life was in grave danger. Now, I am in principle against abortion, but I'm not against Roe versus Wade, and I'm not against people who have abortions. It's precisely because I think we should be conservative about life everywhere, and we don't know. Humanity has never agreed on when a fetus becomes a person. But in the Christian tradition, it's never been that it's at the moment of con conception. Thomas Aquinas, one of the greatest minds, a freak of a genius and a saint and a doctor of the church, 
says that first there's a vegetable soul, then there's an animal soul, and then there's a human soul. And so there is an evolution there. And no one knows exactly. So, yeah, we could be conservative, but also we have to listen to the women for a change, for a change. And many women and couples find that it's not to their survival benefit to have another baby at a certain time. Of course, we would prefer that we have a good orphanage outlet and all that stuff, adoption and everything. But that's not what's at stake here. What's at stake is uh, poor women, usually women of culture, of color, being forced to have babies. And then we have this crazy stuff going on in Texas. Oh, by all means, let's get vigilantes in on this. And they can go after the husband and then go after the doctor and then go after the taxi driver and make $10,000. That's cheap money, fast money, minimum. It's, I mean, this is all masculinity out of control. This is a masculine issue. So we have to be talking about these things. We have to be talking about the reptilian brain out of control with extreme right-wing evangelical Christians on the one hand, and with Opus Dei, Roman Catholic tradition on the other, because the founder of Opus Dei was a card-carrying fascist, Escriva, Spanish priest. And he linked up like this with Franco, the fascist dictator, like this. Many of the Opus Dei, his Opus Dei members were on Franco's cabinet. And in America today, the Archbishop of Los Angeles, the largest diocese in the country, is from the Opus Dei wing of Catholicism. And he was elected by the bishops to be head of the American Bishops Council. And very few Catholic journalists have the balls to tell, talk about this. So I've been talking about it this week. It's got to be talked about. What does it mean? It explains why the Catholic bishops have been trying to tell Biden and Pelosi that they can't take communion because they favor uh, Roe versus Wade. It's, I don't want to go on on this, but it's so stupid. And I've been writing about it this week in the Daily Meditation. But this is real stuff you guys are dealing with in terms of masculinity and defining it appropriately and saying no to its... It's uh, uh, evil dimensions, and uh, which include the killing of Mother Earth and the denial that we're involved in killing Mother Earth. And we have a whole political party in America that's chosen to be in denial of it. That itself is a, a Aquinas says that to to uh, to choose not to entertain truth about something that is important is a mortal sin meaning it's deadly. It's deadly to your own soul, and it's deadly to the community. And that's what denial is. And Meister Eckhart says, God is the denial of denial. God is a denial of a denial. Now, if we're living in denial about real, truthful, important things, then uh, we're godless. We're outside the sphere of divinity. Because not only Christianity, but all the world traditions in their clumsy efforts, our clumsy efforts to name divinity, which is so much greater than any of us can imagine, one of the names that always comes up is truth. Truth matters. It's part of the, the virtue of seeking truth. So, I had two immediate responses when I wrote this book. One was, the first was from a woman. She wrote me an email and she said, I have been studying the goddess for over 30 years. In my home library, I have over 200 books on the goddess. I don't have a single book on the sacred masculine. And I have two teenage sons. Now she said, I don't regret for a minute my journey into the divine feminine, but I never realized until I read your book how much men have suffered under patriarchy. How much men have suffered under patriarchy. We don't talk a lot about this, but slave, mastered, slave masters suffered under slavery. Obviously not like the slaves, not comparing it. 
but they lost their souls. And the slaves went on a search for their souls. And that's why they came up with a powerful music and the powerful expression and choice to choose life, to live, and not be, not totally take in the message from their captors. So that was quite amazing to me. That, and then she said, you know, you are right. We women must get on board with the liberation of men. After all, she said, I'm married to a man. I have two sons. And of course, women have co-workers. They have brothers. They have fathers, grandfathers, uncles, grandsons. And we're in this together. Furthermore, of course, there's a masculine side to the women's soul, an animus there, as there is a feminine and goddess side to the men's soul. And just as men will not be whole until we, we recognize in our home with the goddess and the divine feminine, so women are caught up in, in toxic masculinity to the extent that they do, do not have an authentic understanding and modeling of the masculine for themselves. I remember the first time I did a workshop on, on this book. It was really interesting at CIS in San Francisco. And I invited women as well as men, and about half of each came. And one woman spoke up. She said, I, I first asked, why are you here? One woman spoke up. She said, my father was such a wonderful man, she said. And, and I've never been able to find a, a man like him. So I'm just here to more, hear more about, you know, what is this manhood that's so beautiful and wonderful? And then another woman stood, stood up and she said, I'm here because I had two or three husbands and they were all jokers. And, <laughs> and uh, I'm looking to find, you know, the, the, the healthy masculine too. So very, two very different stories. The point is that uh, women are on a search for the healthy masculine just as men are, whether they know it or not, a conscious or an unconscious search. Now, the second response to this book happened at a conference on earth and spirituality in Santa Fe. And after I gave a talk, a man came up to me, very elegant. He was elegantly dressed. He had tails on. I've never seen him dressed so well at a conference. He was very tall, about six six with white hair, and he was Native American. He came up to me and he said, I've been working in prisons with men for 12 years. He said, men in prison don't want to look inside. One more reason, Bill, that I was glad that you led with that point of the inside work. He said, they're always projecting on others. They don't want to look inside. He said, for 12 years, I've been looking for a book that would get men to look inside, that they would read. He said, yours is the first book that I've ever had that's gotten men to look inside and really start the conversation. And he said, to find, and they find, reading your book, he said, they find the nobility inside. I have goosebumps on that. The nobility inside. What a naming of what's missing in so many men. We've not been given the message that we are noble. And our, these archetypes bring it back. And we'll see where it got lost, where that message got sucked down the drain. But that's the key to transformation for men, is finding the nobility inside. This is why the mystics are so important, and Jesus is important. They talk about our nobility, the royal personhood that's present in the scriptural teachings. And this royal personhood is about our dignity and our nobility, for sure, but it's also about our responsibility. So it's about the, our glory and our responsibility. So, my effort here then was to find 10 metaphors or archetypes that are bigger than any of our cultures, older, more ancient, and any of our religions. No religion has a, a copyright on any of these archetypes. But any healthy religion will invite men into them directly or indirectly, subtly or blaringly. <laughs> the first of these is Father Scott. And it's deliberately first. 
because we come from the sky. We come from the cosmos. And what's so wonderful about today, one sign of the hope today, besides the women's movement and the fledging men's movement, which is way behind the women's movement, unfortunately, um, and deep ecumenism, the coming together wisdom of the world, also one of the great signs of hope today is the new cosmology. Because we're beginning to share a common creation story. And this does not mean you have to abandon your particular creation stories. You know, the Native Americans, when the Europeans landed here, had thousands on this land, had thousands of creation stories. Everyone has something wise to tell us. Here's one that has always stuck in my mind, the Apache. First, God created the dog. The dog was lazy. No, no, not lazy. The dog was, was lonely. Then God created the human. <laughs> I like that. It puts us in our place. This humbles us. Oh, we're here to befriend the dog, so the dog won't be so lonely. That's that's a take. There's a bit of wisdom in that story. And all creation stories carry their wisdom, including the ones in, in the Bible. And there are many in the Bible, far more than just the two in, in the first chapters of Genesis. The Song of Songs has a creation story. And... Uh, the Psalms have creation story. And of course, John 1 is a creation story. And Matthew's story of the nativity is a creation story, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The Bible is flooded with creation stories. You can never have too many creation stories. And they all have something to offer. You don't get bogged down in just one or two. I mean, that's 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 killing your imagination. And with that, your soul. You know, the Celtic definition of soul is imagination. <clears throat> Now, so we're living in this time when science has a story to tell us that our, back the movie of our universe up to the beginning, down to the beginning, 13.8 billion years ago, it started smaller than a zygote and it exploded. We had 700,000 years or so of the fireball burning and in it cooking hydrogen and helium. And out of that came the first galaxies, et cetera, et cetera. And then we come up closer to today, 4.5 billion years ago, we've got the supernova explosions that gave birth to our, our uh, solar system, our Earth and Sun and all the rest. And uh, the point is that we're very late in the process. Obviously, we're, we're the real latecomers. But all these things had to happen before we could be here. And the mystics have talked about this. Julian Norris says we were loved from before the beginning. So the idea that, and many scientists today are saying, in some way, the universe was preparing for us because we're here. <laughs> we're the proof. And so many things that happened on the planet, how the fine-tuning of the oxygen that flowers did several hundred million years ago, and uh, uh, the, the creating that, ozone layer to keep to let enough radiation in from the sun and keep plenty of it out etc etc so many happenings had to occur for us to be here we've been loved from before the beginning father sky now why have we lost this connection to father sky because in the modern era science said that the sky was a machine it was dead out there, inert parts that killed Father Sky. 90% of, of human cultures around the world, Homo sapiens, have stories of Father Sky and Mother Earth. 10% talk about Mother Earth and Father, I mean, Mother Sky and Father Earth, such as the Egyptians. That's wonderful to know. You never get literal about a archetype or about anything important everything important is a metaphor death love life sex it's all a metaphor it's all bigger than than a code of commandments or canon laws or whatever it, these anal retentive characters need to be happy it's all bigger than that so much bigger 
Thomas Aquinas says, every human being is capax universi, capable of the universe. That's why cosmology is important, because we're capable of it. We want it. We're hungry to hear our origins. And this is why every tribe and every religion has its creation stories, an effort to teach us our origins. And now we have one story coming from science that's being believed in India and Africa and Europe and Asia and the Americas. Science is like that. It's a marvelous gift. But of course, first it had to grow up and it had to leave behind the mechanistic universe. And that's the great accomplishment of Einstein and the post-Einsteinian scientists of, our, of, our, of the last century in our own century. This is very good news that Father Sky is alive. Now we know far from being dead and inert and cold object, Father Sky is this. A star is being born every 15 seconds. It's a birthplace. It's a manger. It's a maternity ward. And it's Father Sky. If that doesn't bring us alive again as men, I don't know what will. Because as men in the modern era, when we were told the sky was a machine, inert and cold, we men had to hunker down because there was no place to invest the greatness of our passions, our cosmic passions of love and joy and beauty and grief. Yes, and moral outrage. And of course, they sent us into assembly lines and into mines and all the rest. We had to hunker down and shut our souls down, our, our souls down to fit in those tiny, tiny places. Yves Schumacher says, in the modern era, we now have insurance if your body is hurt at work, but if your soul has heard his work at work, you're on your own. And this is why so many men come home from work and watch TV or drink or get addicted to football or something else. I mean, I love football. I watch it and all that. But the one thing, loving it and watching it and becoming addicted and dependent. You know, we always have to be aware of that. It's another form of idolatry, addiction is. So, Father Sky has returned. And let me just share with you one beautiful quote uh, from a wonderful writer uh, about Father Sky. The book by Scott Russell Sanders, Hunting for Hope, A Father's Journeys. Beautiful book. Can't recommend it enough. In a, in a nutshell, he took his 17-year-old son out for a camping trip. And he was so excited. He thought, this could be the best bonding experience we'll ever have. We'll ever have to blah, blah, blah. So we went out camping, and the whole thing blew up. Because uh, Scott Russell Sanders was doing a lot of writing about Mother Earth and the suffering of Earth today and everything. And he kind of couldn't stop talking about it. And finally, his teenage son said, Dad, will you shut up? Don't you have anything that's hopeful at all to tell me? And instead of their having a, a marvelous bonding, Russell had an awakening. And he took a sabbatical for two years. Now, it's pretty nice when you can take a sabbatical for two years. Uh, but I guess he had made some good money on his good writing. But anyway, he went off for two years looking for hope. That's why he calls it hunting for hope, a father's journeys. And here's just one beautiful passage uh, from that beautiful book. And I, I cited in the chapter on Father Sky. Uh, one day he was driving his car at night and the sky spoke to him. He stopped the car, quote, I climbed out of the car with a greeting on my lips, but the sky hushed me. From the black bowl of space, isn't that a beautiful phrase? From the black bowl of space, countless fiery lights shone down, each one a sun, or a swirl of suns, the whole brilliant host of them, enough to strike me down. And he says, what I've learned is that 
We need to open ourselves up to the world we have not made, to the world we have not made. We're so obsessed with the world humans are making. We need faith. Faith in what? In our capacity for decent and loving work, in the healing energy of wildness, in the holiness of creation. And he says that the universe exists at all, that it obeys laws, that those laws have brought forth galaxies and stars and planets, and on one planet at least, life, and our, and out of life, consciousness, and out of consciousness, these words, this breath, all this is a chain of wonders, a chain of wonders. I dangle from that chain and hold on tight. <laughs> That's an incredible mystical statement by a contemporary of ours living in America today. It's just stunning. I hang on that chain. I dangle from that chain of wonders. That's the universe, folks. It's a chain of wonders. And every day we're getting news from science about another wonder. And you know, the word wonder means miracle. Miracle means that which causes us to marvel. Miracle is not about zapping you and disobeying the laws of Newton and doing it. That might happen sometimes, but the real meaning of miracle is marvel, that which gets us to marvel and to wonder. And that is the first stage of mysticism. Awe, as Rabbi Herschel says, awe is the beginning of wisdom. Okay, so Father Sky is, is the primal archetype because it brought us here. And of course, you can go on about of Mother Earth too and how sky and earth work together, etc. And as Thomas Berry says, e ecology is functional cosmology. Ecology is functional cosmology. So our work in ecology and saving Mother Earth is our gift to the universe because the universe gifted us with Mother Earth. And out of that, with our lives and our dogs' lives and all the rest. Okay, a second archetype that really needs attention today is, of course, the green man. The green man. Now, um, Dennis, I think you might, you might have a cover from the Green Man book you want to show. Uh, do you? I will see if De Dennis is my helper, administrator. No, that's not it. No, no. The, the Green Man uh, book. I thought you brought that along. Uh, okay. Anyway, there are many images of the Green Man. And um, no, 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 no. Not this. No, no, no. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, well, the cover of this book, yeah, this is a green man. Yeah, there's, there's a wonderful book by Armstrong, a, a, a writer, a poet from England, on um, the green man. It's a classic. And his friend, who's a photographer, um, uh, also wrote the book with him and went around to all the 12th century cathedrals where the green man became so prominent when the goddess returned in the consciousness of Europe in the 12th century. So what does a green man represent? Often he has a beard, and the beard is a wreath that goes around his whole head. And in the beard, you find living things like grapes and um, birds and so forth. And often there are boughs coming from his mouth, his fifth chakra, which um, also go around his head like a wreath and so forth. So what's, what does a green man tell us? Thank you, you can take this off now. The green man archetype, is about being a warrior to defend Mother Earth. It's about our, our radical connection to the vegetative world, to the world of plants. And the Native Americans teach that the plants are the wisest of all beings. Why? Because they invented photosynthesis. They learn how to eat the sun. If the plants did not learn how to eat the sun, we're back to cosmology, aren't we? Uh, there would be no animals, there'd be no us, etc. So um, the plants are extremely important. We cannot take them for granted. And of course, plants also grow into trees who, who do such important work for us. But the green man then is this archetype of the warrior who is befriending Mother Earth, 
but finding his or her own uh, energy and centering. And of course, our body is in many ways a tree. Our spinal cord is like a tree and our arms are like branches and our legs are like branches. So there are many ways in which a tree, of course, the trees were the, the plants were the first creatures and trees to leave the water, to leave the ocean and learn to stand up to combat gravity. They had to create circulatory systems that became, of course, our blood system. So we owe them so much. And as you well know, they are the best uh, 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 filterers of carbon dioxide there is. So obviously, we need a lot, lot more trees on the planet today, not less. So the green man is a perfect archetype for a time of ecological crisis and climate change that we find ourselves in. And let us not be sissy and hide or in denial about what's really happening. We are facing our extinction as a species, period. There's no question about it. Science has warned us we have nine years left to change everything. Politics, education, religion, economics, ritual, art, you name it. One of the most sobering meditations I've had lately was reading these stories from science about how they're discovering new hominid species, especially in Southeast Asia. We know about Neanderthal, we know about the Denersons, but now mostly what we know about, you see, is from Europe. But now we're learning more about Asian uh, hominid groups. And now they've counted and named about at least a dozen, maybe 14 but they know they're gonna find a lot more. But the point about all this, besides, you know, it's interesting to read about what we can find out about them, what they ate and so forth and so forth. And the fact that we're carrying their DNA, many of us, Neanderthal and Denerson, and so forth, which means they made love with some of our ancestors and blah, blah, blah. But what's really important is this, the bottom line is this, they're all extinct. Every hominid group that preceded us and lived alongside of us is gone. Well, that's how serious this moment in history is. We are facing our extinction too. And unfortunately, we're bringing down the extinction of so many other beautiful species, all of them older than we are, all of them with their own rights. They were here long before we came along and started messing things up because we went crazy with our reptilian brain and ill-conceived masculine games. Okay, another very important archetype to speak to briefly is, of course, the spiritual warrior. And I, I, I've already spoken to that. The stories from the Native American, the poem from Hafiz, that there's this warrior energy in us. But, of course, it needs steering. It needs direction. It's not meant there to blow up the world or to um, blow up other tribes, other religions, other races. It needs taming. And that reptilian brain, of course, is tamed through meditation because we have three brains. The oldest is a reptilian, 420 million years old. And and the second is the mammal brain, exactly half as old, 210 million years old. And the third is that neocortex, which is very recent, very powerful, and supremely dangerous. It's our brains. It's our intellect and creativity. And um, the reptilian brain, reptiles aren't real good at bonding. They're pretty much win-lose when they get into combat. You... The crocodile is not, you don't really work out a, a truce with many crocodiles. So, um, but what reptiles are good at is lying alone in the sun, solitude. They're really good at solitude. And that's what a monk is. So reptiles are, are monks. And we have a monk, all of us, inside of us. It's our reptilian brain. Of course, the reptilian brain does amazing things for us, such as it's our sexuality. That's nice. 
And um, and it is our, our capacity to do combat, fear, to overcome fear and not just flee, et cetera. But it needs taming. And how do you tame the reptilian brain? By, by meditation. Nice crocodile, nice crocodile. You put them, your reptilian brain to sleep when you do meditation. And um, that is all important because the reptilian brain has obviously been on the loose, unleashed for centuries as we went around raping Mother Earth and the peoples who were the closest to Mother Earth and calling it progress and capitalism and corporate success and all other peculiar, very peculiar names. Now that mammal brain is the brain of the womb people, people with wombs. And the word for compassion comes to the word for womb in both Hebrew and Arabic. And so the compassionate brain especially is the mammal brain. So we have to tame the reptilian brain and invite the mammal brain to play more fully. And that's what Jesus was talking about. It's what Buddha was talking about. It's what Muhammad was talking about. You look at the Quran, by far the most common adjective for Allah is Allah, the compassionate one. And Jesus said, be you compassionate like your creator in heaven. And the Dalai Lama says, compassion is my religion. We can do away with all religion, but not with compassion. Compassion is my religion. And of course, Jesus got his teaching on compassion from the Jewish tradition. In the Jewish tradition, compassion was the secret name for God. And Jesus let the secret out of the bay. And compassion is not pity. In the biblical tradition, compassion is about justice. And Meister Eka says bluntly and directly, compassion means justice. So this work for of spiritual warriorhood is a work on behalf of compassion. And it's learning to uh, allow our reptilian brain its proper place but not to let it run things. It's not here to run things. We have to decouple our brilliant neocortex brains from exclusively the reptilian brain energy and agendas and connect it to our mammal brains of kinship, family, compassion. Another real important archetype is hunter-gatherer. Hunter-gatherer, real important masculine archetype. Because our species, for 95% of our existence, homo sapiens, we were hunter-gatherers. So it's in all of us. So the question is, what are we hunting for today? What are we taught to hunter, to hunt for and gather today? Are we taught to hunt for um, what the highest paying job? To hunt for um, success at any cost? To hunt for sales? Let's all go hunting for sales. Uh, to hunt for the biggest house we can buy, uh, to hunt for parking places. I mean, this hunting gathering energy comes up, but is it coming up in the best possible way? And so it's a real important question. What are we hunting and gathering today? Hunting for solutions to coronavirus? That's a good hunting thing to do. And hunting for news about the rest of the universe and our planetary system about Mars, well, that's interesting. But um, how about hunting for how to calm the reptilian brain? How about hunting for how to make peace? How to be peacemakers, as Jesus talked about. And, um, and of course, justice has everything to do with that making of peace. So how do we bring justice about, etc.? So the questions about hunting are really primal in our, in our nature and in our archetypal consciousness. So we have every right to be asking these questions today. How do we hunt for, for peace between religions? Can, is the crisis of climate change in Mother Earth facing matricide, is this something that can bring the religions together again? Pope Francis tried to do this just before the COP gathering. He called 40 leaders of 40 different religions to the Vatican, either in person or by Skype. 
Zoom. And they came out with a, a single agreed upon document about the sacredness of nature and the necessity of nature. Putting this forward, I've been saying for years, the three most important moral issues of our time are ecology, ecology, and ecology. Not abortion. <sighs> so anyway, um, this might be a whole new awakening for religion to let our differences aside, celebrate the diversity, vive la différence, as the French say, celebrate the diversity for God's sake. Do you think any one of us knows what the hell God is? God is a mystery. Thomas Aquinas said, every being is a name for God. So you think you've got one name for God? And you're going to beat other people up with it? Are you crazy? Are you stupid? Are you totally ignorant? These are the kind of questions Hildegard's asking when she says, make war with yourself, with your stupidity. And I'm not speaking to you personally, but I'm saying what we've been taught, what we've been, what's been shoved into our hearts and into our heads for too many centuries. A little bit of humility is the beginning of a spiritual life. And humility, of course, comes with the word for earth, humus. We should be hunter-gatherers for deep ecumenism, for helping one another draw out the wisdom of all our beautiful traditions. And I want to know one thing from you if you're a Buddhist, or an atheist, or a Hindu, or a Jew. I want to know how you can help me to learn to be more compassionate, which is to say more godlike, to imitate God. And maybe I, as a Christian, can pass something on to you too. Let's get over this competitive bullshit to prove what? Hair on our chest? Good God. And one more archetype I'd like to just allude to briefly is um, the blue man. The blue man is so important at this time in history, so important. Can we put up the picture of the blue man? Yeah, that Hildegard painted the blue man 800 years ago. Um, and it's the cover of my book on her illuminations, her paintings, her visions. This is just one of her visions. And she calls this blue man the, the healing Christ who is in everybody. The healing Christ, the Christ in sapphire blue, she says. And this was a vision she had. And you'll notice where his hands are. Look carefully. They're like this. And I'm going to invite you now. Put your hands at your side and then bring them up into that position, going like this. Now do it again and pay attention to what's happening in your body. You see, you are lifting your chest up and so you are releasing energy from your heart into your hands. It's an absolutely perfect archetype of compassion. Compassion is not feeling sorry for people. It's about working from the heart to relieve the suffering of others, but also to celebrate the joy of others. My Stryker says, what happens to another, whether it be a joy or a sorrow, happens to me. So compassion is 50% about shared joy or celebration and 50% about relieving pain. But this is Hildegard's beautiful painting of the man in sapphire blue. And notice the aperture over his seven chakra, over the top of his head, because that energy then is free to go into the universe. And she talks about this, this mandala, this circle, two circles here, as the Father and Son and Holy Spirit, too. And the ropes, the golden ropes of the universe there. And she says that, evil and the Antichrist and patriarchy, therefore, um, undoes these ropes of gold that hold the cosmos together. Let's show that painting from Hildegard um, about the Antichrist and the patriarchy. Can we show that uh, painting? And because, yes, now, yeah, can you pull it up? I, I only see the, the top part. It may, is everybody, because the bottom part is what really Hits you. There you go. Thank you. That's better. Um, 
In the left-hand corner, she talks about she, each of these animals are depictions. Uh, they all have this black rope in their mouth, whether a lion, a horse, uh, a wild dog, and something else there. there and they're undoing the ropes of the universe. She just those golden ropes you just saw in her painting of the of creation. Because uh, she says that's what chaos does. These are evil powers. These are the Antichrist, she says, undoing the order of the universe. And I, I'd like to throw this in. I'm just being honest with you. I'm 80 years old now. I don't have to hold anything back. This um, Supreme Court decision that is hanging over us, if they actually go through with it, and do it with, with um, Roe versus Wade, there is going to be so much chaos in our country. So much chaos. There already is in Texas. Talk to people there about what's going on in the women's community, especially poor women's communities, especially poor women's communities of color who do not have the resources to fly to another state and blah, blah, blah. Chaos will reign. And believe me, no one will believe a word of what the Supreme Court says from him. So it's exactly what um, uh, Judge uh, Sotomayor was saying yesterday. A stench will go forth. We will no longer believe in, in the Supreme Court. I mean, it's hard enough to believe in it now with what they've done gutting the voting, voting rights rules and so much else. But with that, it'll be the end. So there will be utter chaos in this country. Law will be out the window, which is exactly, frankly, what Bannon has said he wanted to happen uh, and so forth. So you, you we're on in real times. We're facing a lot of darkness. Now, on the right in the top is the Christ. And... Um, He's, as she says, this is a young virile man with holding his fingers up like, like a peace sign. When he, she says they stand for um, Enoch and um, Elijah, the coming of the prophets and so forth. That's what Christ is. That's his lineage, etc. But down at the bottom, look carefully. Now, you don't have to be a Freudian to see what Hildegard has painted here. And she painted it 800 years before Freud. So... What you got there is patriarchy out of control. You've got a phallus that is very vicious. And the big, it looks like the B-2 bomber flying over there. That's shit. That's what she says. That's a pile of shit that's flying around. I mean, this is a doctor of the church, folks. And a saint, she's telling it like it is and like it was. <laughs> and, uh, and by the way, that picture on the left, with the phallus, that's Mother Church. But what she's saying is that the Antichrist or evil has entered the church and is uh, that uh, penis out of control. And I would say that's a marvelous painting of Opus Dei, for example, or of these right-wing evangelists uh, telling us how blessed we are if we worship an authoritarian president. So um, I just felt as men, we should be looking at this and written by, painted by a woman. You know, uh, many saints have a lot more balls than men do uh, and uh, a lot more courage. Tell it like it is. And uh, she's telling it like it is. So thank you. Um, we don't have to stare at this overly much, but I just think it's an amazing chapter in the history of self-awareness for men and women. And uh, as Bill said, this getting to love is a journey. And I hope that some of these archetypes and some of what I've shared with you tonight um, are, um, are paths to transformation that you can take out to our hungry, hungry, bleeding, bleeding, scared, scared world of so many scared men that they have to hide behind the patriarchal walls of denial and narcissism and beating up on women, misogyny, as if it's some kind of virtue. That's why this whole thing about virtue and vice is so important. What are our values? What are you going to bring your male energy to, your spiritual warriorhood to? 
And um, I have to share this one thing about the blue man. Oh, yeah, it just came up this week, but it's so important. Brilliant. Um, it's in the, um, you can go online, and the, the, the title of this article is Youth Hail for Providing Renewal Energy to 10,000 People. A teenager in Africa named Thoronko, T-H-O-R-O-N-K-A, Thoronka, um, he lived in a village in uh, Sierra Leone that has only 26% people with electricity. He said, this is crazy. He invented a device that you put under roads and it, uh, so it's not, you're not getting the electricity from sun power or wind power or coal or oil or gas. You're getting it from the everyday presence of cars and trucks on our roads. I mean, the potential of this to turn around climate change. And he was just awarded an $100,000 award. Um, and um, uh, it's, he said, I wanted to develop a more sustainable energy system, educate people about energy efficiency and stop their overuse of natural resources. The sun is not always shining, water is drying up, fossil fuels are not always going to be used, but people are always moving. So why not create this little kinetic gadget he did uh, to pick up the power? And now he's, he's provided um, electricity for 150 homes, 15 schools, 10,000 people, 9,000 of whom are students in Africa. And this is a 17-year-old teenager. This is the blue man. Look to the young for the blue man. Look to Africa for the blue man. Look to anger where there's outrage and where there's concern. The blue man is just dying to come forward because the blue man is about healing and also about creativity, about creativity, about art. Robert Bly chose to be an artist to wake men up through poetry and ritual. Jesus cho chose to be an artist, a parable storyteller to wake people up. And it cost him his life. And he set something in motion. So big. So the blue man is, uh, is back. And we elders should be so much, so busy encouraging young men and women to be blue men, to be spiritual warriors, to be hunter-gatherers, to be in touch with Father Sky, as well as Mother Earth. Amen. We just spend 30 seconds in silence. may not be necessary to say, but we just heard a prophet. Anthony? Yeah, so we can start the question and response time now. It's 8.12. I guess we can have, we have just about a little bit, a little less than 20 minutes. So if you want, you can post your question in the chat. Gene just did. Uh, or you can just uh, raise your hand if you want to speak your question. We can do it that way too. We just use the uh, raise your hand so we can see that you have a question. Uh, so Gene has a question. What can men our age group do to stem this tide? Well, I, I'm, I'm glad that you're going to be meditating on the archetypes because I do think that we should really befriend these archetypes. Um, and they go so deep that they relate to any one of our traditions. Uh, you can find Jesus um, playing out these archetypes. Our Father who art in heaven. 
And, and um, so he's dealing with the cosmos all the time. And especially if you go back to the Aramaic translations of Jesus, you'll find that as in, you know, we shouldn't get stuck in the Greek, Latin, German, English, Spanish versions of the scriptures, really. When you're getting to the heart of it, you should take a look at what the Aramaic has been telling us. Because the Aramaic language, which Jesus spoke, he didn't speak any of those other languages, not even Hebrew, is a very, uh, it's a peasant language, it's quite primitive, and it's very playful. And there are many ways to translate uh, the words that, that um, we've often translated in, in ways that have become very stilted and over-familiar. Um, there's a, a book I really recommend, a small book by Neil Douglas Klotz, K-L-O-T-Z called Prayers of the Cosmos, where he translates the Our Father and the Beatitudes using um, Aramaic. And so he has about seven versions of each line of the Our Father and of the Beatitudes. And so you get a real feel, for a much better feel for Jesus' soul and how, how cosmic it is um, uh, and, uh, and playful and mystical. So... Um, that's one thing to, to and, and I'm just there. I was just speaking to Christians, but for Jews can go into their tradition and Buddhists into theirs and atheists into theirs. And um, uh, so, so that's one thing because these archetypes, as I said earlier, do not belong to any tra one tradition. They're deeper than that. They found in all of us. And of course the indigenous peoples uh, talk about father sky. I was with, Eddie Kneebone one night in Australia, he's an uh, Aboriginal, and of course the Aboriginals are probably the oldest tribe on the earth, 65,000 years or so. And it was a starry night there in Australia, and he's, we were looking at it, and he said, you know, we don't teach our children that these stars are so many millions of years away or anything like that. We teach them that these stars are our ancestors at a campfire up in the sky. Our ancestors are on the campfire, and they're looking down on earth for our campfires. What's cooking? <laughs> what are we doing? And what I love about that is the personalization of Father Scott. And these people, they're not facing extinction after 300 years like we are in America. They've been around 65,000 years. They're still around. And uh, and th this kind of thing kept them together. Father Sky, it's a very and of course as Jesus take on the word for God the Father, isn't it? Uh, Abba, it's so personal and intimate. It really means Daddy, Papa. So that's how Aboriginals have been teaching their kids for sixty five thousand years, but that's how Jesus looked at it two thousand years ago too. So. Um, you can translate, you take these archetypes and run with them into the traditions that are that nourish you. And again, that's the wonderful thing about dealing with art. It's not right and wrong. It's not uh, black and white. It, you know, these Aboriginals, when they look at paintings, they put them on the floor. They put their paintings on the floor, not on the wall. And everyone sits around in a circle. So everyone has a different angle on the painting. So everyone has something interesting to say. And there's not, oh, you're right and you're wrong. No. And we should always be thinking more in terms of circles than in ladders. That's another shadow to masculinity is the idea that we're here to climb ladders instead of um, gather in circles. I'm sure your group gathers in circles. That's where democracy is, when we can look into each other's eyes and hear each other speak and uh, not be looked down on from someone in a skyscraper or the equivalent uh, when we look like little ants or something. So um, really work hard on absorbing these, these uh, archetypes. And um, I think that's a very important way to begin and uh, start applying them, not only to your religious teachers like Jesus, but also to um, what's going on in society. You know, um, uh, there is, is 
Are we perverting Father Sky insofar as some people, billionaires, are dreaming about going and they want to, they think they're going to get away from Earth because we made such a mess of it and they're going to live in Mars. Well, how about the billions left behind? You know, uh, I mean, you know, there's some weird stuff going on, really, even in, in minds that are genius minds. I won't mention Musk by, by name, but um, I think that. Uh, we, you know, that it's not enough just to discover Father Sky and the history of the universe, but, you know, what is it telling us? What is it telling us in terms of our dignity, our, the wonder that we're here, but also in terms of our responsibility? What work comes through us because of these messages? So, again, I, you could spend so much time. I'll tell you one thing I do when I have retreats around these archetypes, I... I will speak for just about 10 minutes or so about an archetype. I don't want to go on too long. And then I'll break them up into groups and tell them each group very spontaneously because there's no preparation. They've just heard about it. Go off and create, for example, a skit about Father Sky, if that's the archetype, or a skit about the Green Man or a skit about the Hunter Gatherer. And, um, and it's amazing because it gets it into their bodies and into their imaginations. Then they come back. You don't give them too much time, 15, 20 minutes max. They come back and they put on their skit. And in the process, first they have to work together and argue about what they're going to do and not do, and then make it fun. It's full of laughter and fun. But this is how you, you learn an archetype, by playing, by playing with it, not thinking about it playing with it and play is always bodily so that's how you get it into your bones and into your molecules where it's going to matter so i really encourage that methodology in terms of the archetypes and uh and then of course you sit and listen to another skit by another group and you learn more about the archetype and you laugh more etc etc and again it's not a competition <laughs> this is not oh who made the best green man no and of course, you pick up stuff that's around, and you can use that in in your in your skit too to you know to to make a point and so forth. So anyway, I really recommend that putting together, if you call it theater and play and archetype building. Um, by building, I mean deepening into the soul, where play, imagination, and laughter um, work their way out. All right, thank you, Matthew. There's a, we don't. I don't think we'll have time to get to all the questions, but there was a couple. Karen had one, and maybe they somewhat relate. It's so all read Karen and Dave's. Karen asks, can you describe some of the rituals that are healing for men, and how can I, as a woman, encourage this for men? And then, uh, so you mentioned rituals as a method for men, right? So sure. what she's asking, I guess, for specifics. And Dave is asking a personal question. What have been your most profound personal practices that contributed to your awareness and understanding? And along that line, were there rituals or initiations in your lifetime that helped you personally? Going back Let me to begin with the second question first. Um, for me, Native American rituals have been, what can I say? A sine qua non for my survival. <laughs> Very, very important. I was blessed to have Native American teachers. I grew up in Wisconsin. I had Native American dreams from the time I was very young. The Native American presence is very strong still on the land of Wisconsin. But um, Buck Ghostorus was a Lakota teacher who came, um, literally showed up at my door one day at Holy Names College in Oakland, uh, just when I was opening my school there, having moved from Chicago. And he, he told me this story that he'd been dreaming for years. Dreams had told him he should work with white people. For 10 years, he said he didn't want to, and he turned them down. But they were getting so fierce, he, he realized he had to respond. And he looked around, and he saw this thing called creation spirituality. And he, he and his wife, they were living in South Carolina. They packed their car and drove out to Oakland. He appeared one day. Make a long story short, he taught my faculty for three years there and uh, taught courses on Native American spirituality and so forth. And he had a sweat lodge on campus. And by the way, one of the objections to my work by Cardinal Ratzinger was that I worked too closely with Native Americans. 
And I, I think what he means is that his sweat lodge at a Catholic campus in Oakland for three years. But anyway, the word got back to the Vatican. And, um, and of course, sweat lodges are marvelous. And um, then he went on to um, create his own center up in the Washington, state of Washington. And I did a vision quest with him there. At the time that I was silenced by the Vatican uh, for a year, I began my retreat. The only, the only sabbatical I've ever had in my life was when I was silenced by the Vatican. For a year. But I began it with a vision quest, and it was mind-blowing, just amazing. And um, I've done powwows and, of course, uh, sun dances. And, of course, they are amazing, too. And uh, for a couple of years, I just went to sun dances and the outer circle with many of the women and so forth. I prayed and danced that way. But then after a few years, I was doing that at a first day of a sun dance, and I got a message that Buck wanted to see me. And he said, the elders feel you should be in the middle and dancing there. So, so I, I did a sweat and they put me in the middle and I had amazing experience dancing sun dances um, that really brought my Christianity and my indigenous Lakota prayer together uh, in an amazing fashion. So I've been so blessed, so deeply, deeply blessed by Native American spiritual practices. And I, I recommend to anyone, if you have an invitation or can conjure up one <laughs> to go to a sweat lodge or any of these practices, they are real. And they're physical, they're bodily. And of course, they're especially good for men because women already have a physical ritual every month, uh, but men don't. And uh, too many of our so-called liturgies or worship services are, are about reading things from books or something or in um, singing, when singing isn't bad, but the point is we need bodily practices. And I'll tell you, my first 20 minutes in a sweat lodge, the very first one was in Minnesota at a gathering of Native American there, a powwow. I thought I was going to die. I was looking for a fire exit, and there wasn't one. I was looking for a fire extinguisher, and there wasn't one. So I yielded to the experience. And that's when you go into a transcendent experience. So these more ancient people know something about taking us to the edge. And that's what all mysticism is about. It's about going to the edge. And, um, and the fact is, I came out of that sweat lodge. I, I, I had been in a serious car accident. My back was really hurting me when I went in and all this. I came out with my back healed, among other things. And uh, so that was just the first of countless sweat lodges that I've been blessed with over the years. So, and then uh, another, then back to the first question. Um, when I became an Episcopalian, I did it to work with young people in Sheffield, England, who were in the rave movement, who were reinventing worship using rave. And um, I had just finished my book on reinventional work, and the last chapter was on reinventing ritual, and I said, we have to bring the body back, among other things, uh, but especially the body and silence and so forth. Well, um, a group of young Sheffield people, including the priest who led this group, flew to Seattle for a conference I was doing right when I handed my book in and told me about their what they were doing with worship. And I was blown away. And to make a long story short, I visited it and I checked it out. It was amazing. And um, I asked them, what can I do? How can I help you? And they said, well, if you become Episcopal priest, you could lead the way because most priests don't get what we're doing, and we're using your theology anyway, your book on the cosmic Christ and so forth. So I prayed about it, thought about it. The Pope had already fired me. I was kicked out of the Dominicans. I checked with my local diocesan bishop if they would take me, and no, I'm radioactive. No one would take me as a priest. I didn't mind not being a priest, but these young people said, you can help us. I said, what the hell? So I went to the Episcopal Bishop of San Francisco and said, here's the deal. I think I'd become Episcopalian priest, but only to work with young people to reinvent forms of worship. And he gave me a green light. I said, go for it. We're not doing anything for young people in the church. It's horrible what we're not doing. So anyway, um, so I've, I've, I'm very grateful to the Episcopal Church for uh, accepting me. And we've done over 100 of these. We call them the Cosmic Mass. Uh, we, we've done it three times now at three different uh, parliaments of religion gatherings. And um, 
And we include, you see, it's about dance, not sitting in a pew, daring someone to keep you awake with the sermon or finding what page you're supposed to be on. So um, it's much more primitive because it is about praying by dancing. Um, but we bring in VJs and DJs. So you have these images that are telling the story. So we have a theme for each mass, such as the return of the divine feminine or um, the, uh, the, the Black Madonna or the sacred earth or the Celtic spiritual or the African diaspora experience, you know, a theme for each mass. And then you have slides and pictures that, that tell the stories of these things. And then we dance to these. And then we also do a grieving, always we do a grieving ceremony, to get down on all fours, which is really all sixes and do powerful grieving practice that I developed over the years. And then the communion, and, um, and then the final dance, which is a, um, a strong dance of the warrior, because you're going out to be a warrior on behalf of, uh, of good causes, if you will, in the world afterwards. And it's just been amazing. And we've drawn all people from all kinds of tourism and Muslims. And after 9-11, we had a mass of, uh, of, of Rumi in order to honor the Muslim community. We brought in an Iman who lectured on, preached on Rumi and so forth. But, um, uh, and that meant a lot to the, to the strong Muslim community in the Bay Area, because as you know, there's a lot of Islamophobia right after 9-11. And we've had a Kabbalah mass honoring the Jewish tradition. And um, uh, so people of all kinds come, including atheists. We, what, <laughs> we did a mass at, in, for a thousand people in uh, at Sounds True a Retreat Center, and uh, they have a annual retreat and in the mountains of Colorado. And afterwards, this woman came up to me. She said, I'm an atheist. I'm such a fierce atheist that when I'm walking down the street and there's a church, I cross the street to go by the church. But she said, something happened to me tonight. And she pointed at her heart. She said, during that grieving experience, something happened to me. And by the time communion came along, she said, I had to have some. I was hungry. And she said, this night has changed my life. And she went away. One time a man came up to me after it and he said, I haven't been to church in 24 years, but I was so moved tonight. I took communion twice. Is that okay? <laughs> I said, sure, just, just don't tell the Pope. So anyway, that's our, our cosmic mass and I recommend it. And it always includes the grieving ceremony. Now, once sounds to invited me to come out and do a, a, a ritual just for grieving, for 800 people. And they came from all traditions. There were atheists and humanists and Buddhists and Hindus and Christians and Sufis, 800 people. And I led them for an hour in this grief ritual. And afterwards, there was some amazing sponsor. One guy came up and he said, he said, I've been seeing a psychiatrist for 21 years. I'm firing her on Monday. He said, this is all I needed. And I never knew it. All I had to do was let go of the ritual of, of the grief inside of me and so forth. So, um, yeah, it's, it's imperative that we be creating rituals today. For example, I've just written a new daily meditation. I wrote it today. I'm proud of it. It'll be in, in a few years, a few days from now, about, about rituals for women who have had abortions. In my university several years ago, Clarissa Pincola Estes, the esteemed Jungian therapist, wonderful woman, was teaching with us and she heard enough back from women that she created a ritual for women who had had abortions. And it was so important and so powerful. And I, I make this point in my article that's coming out in a couple of days. This is something the churches could be doing around abortion instead of waging war against women's rights and rights to their own body. Who the hell, I say that in tomorrow's thing. You people in black robe Supreme Court, where does the Constitution give you permission to tell women what to do with their bodies? Period. That's the question here. The rest is bullshit. So anyway, that's something churches could be doing. Creating rituals, because I was doing retreat years ago at Big Sur, and a woman said she needed to see me personally, privately, and, and she told me she'd had abortion years before. And it still haunted her. It still bothered her. And she was wondering, what is her relationship to that, that being that she did not give full, full 
birth too. So we talked about when we created a simple ritual, that of course she has a relation with that being and that being with her. And they can befriend each other. We don't just live in this world, no matter what our stupid culture tells us. We're living with angels. We're living with spirits. We're living with ancestors. We're living with a community of saints. And they expect us to wake up and grow up. Start, stop acting like babies and teaching other people to be babies. Babies are beautiful. But so are adults, so we ought to be. So I'll never forget that, that experience. And then it was later that Carissa Pincola Estes created a ritual out of her experience for women who have had abortions. And, um, you know, that's something very positive that religion could be doing instead of trying to dictate to women what their bodies, what can happen in their bodies. It's just appalling, the misogyny that patriarchy has plastered all over our culture and often the name of religion. There's a saying among the medievals, you know, corruptio optimi est pessima. Corruption of the best is the worst. There's nothing worse than bad religion, than corrupt religion. And uh, we've had a lot of it these past years. And this Supreme Court is a culmination of it, a zenith. And we all better be on guard because I think Sotomayor is absolutely right. If they go through with this in the name of whatever it is, it's, you know, it's obviously a religious passion that some of them have. Um, they go through with that. I, I think the whole rule of law is going to take us into the into the chaos that Hildegard painted. And I think Sotomayor said that, said it to her colleagues, and she was a, a voice in the wilderness. Matthew, why don't we do this? Uh, we normally end with a poem, and you mentioned uh, Hafiz, right, early? And uh -huh. so it just so happens that's the poem Bill and I chose. Wow. And I'll, I'll bring it up on the screen. And really? maybe the way we've done this, it's if the, we need 15 voices. It's kind of nice to hear a different voice. So I'll bring it up on the screen. And uh, for the 45 of us that are left, 44 without Matthew, whoever wants to, uh, just you don't have to rush through it. I'll highlight it. It would be nice to hear. Make sure you go off of mute. If two people join at the same time, just we'll figure out who's going to go. But we'll have 15 different voices read each part of this. It's called, mm -hmm. How Does It Feel to Be a Man? So, and I'll highlight them so we can go in order. So whenever someone's ready, we could start with the first line. Remember to go off of mute. Once a young woman asked me, How does it feel to be a man? And I replied, my dear, I am not so sure. Then she said, Well, no, aren't, aren't you? Man? And this time I replied, I view gender as a beautiful animal that people often take for a walk on a leash. <laughs> And might try to enter in some odd contest to try to win prizes. My dear, a better question for Hafiz would have been, how does it feel to be a heart? For all I know is love. And I find my heart infinite and everywhere. So 